Moss talk is by uh, Aydin Monsenio from Pittsburgh. Uh, he is now a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Philosophy of Science. And he works on uh, social epistemology of science and using mostly formal methods. Uh, so he authored several papers on uh, epistemic norms in science and how to best change them. So this applies directly to the topic of scientific reform proposals and uh, to how to evaluate them. Uh, so as a consequence, how to intervene in the replicability crisis, uh, which is uh, the topic of his talk today. So the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for a thoroughly engaging set of talks today. And certainly, uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you will uh, be very much in conversation with what we've been discussing so far. And indeed, uh, in some senses, I'm going to pick up uh, where we left off in the backdrop of the replication crisis, uh, the many kind of other challenges and opportunities that it is indicated for us, and in particular, against the backdrop of a profusion of proposals about how to navigate our way toward a better future state of science. So here, I'm going to, to say a few things about how I think about this. The question that actually I added here, which is, uh, how should we assess the proposals to change uh, our methodologies and practices in science? Uh, and the, the note I want to add is that I think very much of the replication crisis as not something to uh, feel bad about, but rather very much as an opportunity. The problems that we saw were not typically new problems, problems that have been with us in science for a long time. Uh, and with respect to the aim of doing science better, I expect that that's something that we're going to be interrogating ourselves about uh, for as long as we do science. And becoming aware that, that uh, we could do better, I think it's very much a good thing. The, the aim of this talk is to present a framework for modeling some of the interventions proposed and thinking in a rigorous way about their potential implications. Uh, at the object level, right, uh, I'm going to use this framework uh, and hopefully demonstrate its value for you by looking uh, at interventions and seeing in particular how some that are going to look good and reasonable and perfectly sensible when you think of them as applying to a single study uh, can look quite differently when you consider what it means to apply them to a population of studies, very much in line with our theme of individual and collective inquiry. Yeah, indeed, what we're going to see is that there can be a reversal of desired improvement produced when an intervention, right, one of these changes. So I want you guys just to kind of be clear that we'll go into more depth. Think redefine statistical significance, lower alpha, right? Think let's promote or require pre-registration. Right, let's promote or require uh, higher power studies. These are the kind of reforms I'm thinking about, right? Uh, so the framework, we're gonna look at how these reversals can happen whenever there's variation in the statistical properties of, our, of, of the studies that we have in a field where we're applying the intervention. And there is variation and how those studies are affected by the intervention. Uh, and in the backdrop, in particular, for these examples, uh, publication bias is going to be playing a deranging role. And uh, I shouldn't need to give us any more reasons why this is a bad thing. But in fact, I think this, this is one more update for you as to why publication uh, bias really is uh, even more deranging than it is uh, given credit for. So importantly, my aim is not to argue against the interventions where I'm gonna show 
the uh, an obvious result and potential backfire effects. Right? Many of them I strongly support. Right? We're going to look at in particular at pre registration right? and uh, volunteer pre registration as one of those. And uh, I am uh, at this point quite convinced that pre registration in general, and certainly things like registered reports in particular, are going to play a critical role in moving toward a healthier, more confident future science. Uh, right, judicious, judiciously employed, the, each of the interventions that we're going to look at have a place, in, either temporary or, or uh, for, for quite a bit longer in methodological reform. Uh, but as we'll see, thinking carefully about the, the effects of these interventions and change our estimations of their impact in ways that we're going to care about. So this is the framework I, I want to introduce to you. Right. Uh, I'm going to call it the, the filter model of science. Right. And some of you will be uh, familiar uh, with what this is an adapt adaptation of. Right. When you need it, wrote a kind of similar work on, on why people's findings are false, right? This was that model. And later after my books like um, Bonus, uh, uh, Tufano, and Lift. And where it is a standard kind of model of methodological bias in science. We start with uh, considering a unit mass of statistically independent studies. Our study is uh, understood as consisting of a pair right, of hypotheses, a test in particular of a null and alternative hypothesis. And let right, theta denote a fraction of null hypotheses that are in fact true. Uh, actually, I think for here, we're, we're going to invert this. Uh, we're going to make theta the fraction of hypotheses that are true, nulls that are false. So we begin with our unit mass of studies, the fraction that are true, the fraction false. A test is going to have the properties right, uh, that it does, in particular, a type two and one error rate. Right? And it's going to filter these hypotheses that are brought to bear the test and the power of the fraction of true ones are going to come up significant, as are the type one error rate on the fraction of false. And these will constitute our significant findings, which then go on to be published. Good. The so one measure of Often central discussion and concern is the false discovery rate. And this is just the fraction of significant bindings that are also false. Looking at, at our uh, last layer of our filter model, the published studies, we're looking at all of these and the fraction of them that were derived from the false hypotheses that attain significance. And the reason that folk often care about this, an essential reason, uh, is that this is the underlying theoretical quantity for which the rate of failed replication is an estimator. And you say, look, you know, uh, this fraction of our studies in this quarter of the social and biomedical sciences failed to replicate. We're saying implicitly, right, indicating what we think this underlying quantity is. We're worrying about this. Fraction of the things that you say are so that aren't. And now, using this filter model, right, we can begin to think in a way that I want to share with all, and then we can perhaps take over the course of the workshop. It's nice that we have something like this in the background of, of our thinking, of our shared thinking. Right? Uh, so we can do a number of things. One is we can think about the interventions and think about where in this filtration process are they occurring. So when we make proposals like lower the significant threshold or raise study power, we're affecting the type one and two error rates of studies at the level of test, at the intermediate filter, right? When we say pre-registration, we're constraining researcher degrees of freedom, right? Impacting, again, the filter of the test. 
Uh, whereas, you know, when we say that we should do registered reports, right, we're not just affecting the properties of the test, we're also affecting what gets published, right? Or when we promote journals of null results, we're changing the final distribution uh, at the level of publication. We're changing that filter and saying, look, we're going to have more information here. And it's often available. And when we get the unhelpful suggestion, sometimes quite appropriate, that we should improve theory, we're changing the initial fraction of hypotheses that researchers in a given domain and discipline bring to test in the first place. Right? And this is, of course, you know, an important but sometimes neglected theoretical quantity. This is what makes the difference between, right? Uh, certain particularly beleaguered parts of social psychology or nutrition science and particle physics. Right? Is the initial fraction of hypotheses that are brought to test by that field are, are different. The theory is differently strong in the domain. Good. This kind of filter model can also clarify what's really at play here, which is there are a sequence of decisions that can be made that are up to us to determine. So when I filter the evidence that I get, right, here, one can choose how to publish. You can think of, you know, is, is it post-publication peer review that's happening, right, or pre-publication peer review that's happening. You can think of the distribution of information that's available and which of these distributions do you want to act on for what. <coughs> what I mean is, first, the first thing that I want to highlight and kind of connecting with the earlier conversation with uh, uh, and, and, uh, Dr. Evans, right? When we're saying what matters to us right, about these studies, and I'm very much uh, in strong agreement with the fact that we care about much more than replication. And the balance of those concerns is something that we implicitly already have evaluations around. But being more explicit is going to be one of the kind of necessary methodological advances of a more self-aware science. Right? Uh, we already kind of encode these in hypothesis tests to a degree, but without an awareness really of their kind of population level effect. And what I mean by that is whenever one does a, a null hypothesis significance test, right, that alpha and beta act the, uh, are encoding acceptable error rates and a trade-off between error rates for the decision, call it significant or not, that kind of strange speech act of that framework, right? They're saying how much more do you care about avoiding false positives than attaining right, false negatives? Each of those areas matter more to you is built in. They're going to, they're going to be built in in impactful ways for each field based on what they're aiming for. And so we can ask, what is the false discovery rate? We can ask, what is the false omission rate? The analogs of those error rates at the level of the population of studies, the fraction of them that we say are that are true that aren't, and the fraction of them that we say that aren't that are, right? Absolute discovery rate, the point of right, what happens. How much do we care about just the productivity of time? Exaggeration ratio. What is the expected difference in the magnitude of the effect size, right? Of the published and real effects, which is going to be quite important for domains where that matters, for things like medicine. This is a common uh, refrain from both who say, I went to go study this scientific finding that promised to uh, produce a genuinely impactful new treatment. What you find is you know, a shadow of that, even though it's technically you know, significant or technically in the right direction. Or there's sign error, uh, race as well that one can care about. How with the frequency with which the area of the opposite sign as the one that is reported. And informativeness, which is something that I'm happy to talk more about. And some of my most recent thinking and research has been on the kind of Bayesian and more thoroughly decision theoretic assessment of which of these choices about how to change right, this filtering process will produce the most information for action from a Bayesian perspective. So, uh, and then you know, quantifying that uh, information theoretically. What is the rate of you becoming more competent if you were something like a Bayesian meta-analyst, right, to make the best, best policy decision, the best medical decision, if you were looking at the output of a scientific team?
And again, thinking of this as uh, a sequence of decisions that come out of this kind of information gathering process, uh, you can kind of close your eyes and imagine the, the state of science in which you come together the field, wherever you're in, right? Uh, whether you're in the appropriate part of uh, social psychology or microecon or medicine. And you say, these are the types of studies that we want. This is what an exploratory study means for us. And these are the acceptable error rates and statistical properties that we want uh, out of our exploratory studies. This is what a confirmatory study means for us, right? <coughs> we set the standards for that and make it something quite different. You accommodate that sometimes you're doing a, let's say in cancer research, a moonshot. You don't want to miss true hypothesis. And you can give the appropriate intervention for that kind of exploratory work. Whereas if you're in phase three clinical trials and deciding whether a medicine should hit the shelves for imminent consumption, you're going to have very different valuations of the types of errors that are acceptable. Now, and you can kind of recognize the other distinctive aim of the scientific field. It's going to vary from discipline to discipline, right? When you're in a young field where theory, theory development matters, we're going to think differently about each of these. And in that kind of, I think, nearby state of science, we'll have come together, had conversations with the field, right? And said, here are the types of studies that we think at this moment in time for a discipline best forward the goals of what we're up to. And we recognize that you don't trust the exploratory study and go around, you know, to science, uh, popular science publications and say, I found out that broccoli cures cancer, right? right? And you treat something like canonization as a decision procedure quite differently than you do confirmation for this kind of policy activity, right? Exploration for another phase of testing. And we're clear about what we're doing there. Uh, good. So this framework, I think, uh, I, I, I want to, Give it to us to think about and also indicate how it naturally right, uh, breaks off into decisions that themselves can be made sharper and begin to, to show us any direction that we want to go. Right? And that we, we've lots of people have thought about this, lots of people I think have something like this either uh, implicitly or explicitly in mind as to what it would look like to do better. Right? But having this kind of framework can make it easy to talk about. What properties of this process best enable these different aims? Right? What are the trade offs? Right? And what, what, what does it, uh, it look like to optimize for one or the other? Good. So let's start with one of these proposals for methodological change, right? redefining statistical significance. This was a very, very uh, famous piece that came out in Nature Human Behavior with. Uh, Several hundred uh, prominent methodologists endorsing a shift from a, a 0.05 to 0 0.005, right? A significant threshold. And uh, I'm going to show you, right, uh, potential problems to this proposal. But in the three of what I said earlier, with the caveat of, uh, I think this is the, we are going to want to change our significant threshold right, in lots of fields when we have a clear picture of what we're up to in those fields. And what for the type of study we're interested in, right? So it's not bad to say, let's change in this direction, or, and I'm going to give you arguments, right? Uh, in fact, I think uh, something like this is what we're going to should do in a number of fields. But also, I think a careful consideration, they're going to tell us cases where we want to do the opposite, it, right? There are absolutely reasons they can tell you to increase the significant threshold for the kind of appropriate uh, exploratory uh, set of studies. Uh, and indeed, as we become more rigorous in this domain, it would be a miracle if our current significant threshold was the perfect one for all the aims that we have. That's not, we didn't get that lucky. Yeah, and we can absolutely do better. Good. So remembering our filter model, right? Lowering the significant threshold is intervening right here on the level of the test, and in particular on the type one error, right? So far, the researcher adheres to the significant threshold. You, you know the methodology. You fix your type one error rate, and then you get whatever power you do in your field. Good. And you can see why 
people spoke with, with expect this to produce an improvement in, in particular in the false discovery rate. And it's going to lower the false discovery rate. And if you change from 0.05 to 0.005 or any lower alpha, well, the fraction of significant hypotheses that are false positive will be lower. So, for example, uh, of the application of our framework, right, the intervention we're considering is lowering the significance threshold. Uh, our background problems are that there are questionable research practices that folk engage in uh, producing differences in study sounds <coughs> from study to study. Uh, and there is indeed uh, our serious problems with publication bias. Our observation is that study employing more questionable research practices can attain significance more easily and effectively than those that do not. And, and just kind of refresh for, for those of us who don't immediately light up with the kind of uh, concrete examples of what the QRPs consist of. I think uh, selectively including excluding outliers, right? The deployments of optional stopping, uh, changing the measure that one has that's all significant to the team. Basically, all the places where we have from the gathering. Uh, an analysis of the data to, to wiggle consciously or unconsciously and in order to attain significance. And we know that these are biased in one direction and that is forward attaining significance. And I noted this first example that I'm going to show you is this result is not my own. The next two are going to be from me. This is uh, one that was published in 2020 by statistician Crane. But actually, I want to point folks to an earlier publication with a more uh, by Williams in 2019, which also provides a more general proof uh, of the same dynamic I'm going to show you. Right. So we have our QRP. And this is just a moment where we discuss uh, how it is that they are directionally biased toward significant null results. Uh, and again, with this audience, I don't need to remind you how easy it is uh, to do or how prevalent these practices are. So there are great sources for both. But I want to show you, so how do we model methodological soundness in this framework? Well, a perfectly sound study attains significance, right? When a null hypothesis uh, is true with a frequency corresponding to the significant threshold. A perfectly sound study, if my threshold is 0.05, will attain significance when the null is true. Right? It's going to have a false positive one out of 20 times. But a less than perfectly sound study then will attain significance when the null hypothesis is true with a frequency greater than that. And we can quantify that with some coefficients, right? Uh, of methodological unsoundness, where k is greater than one. The ideal study, let's say, would be one out of 20 times. And we saw kind of a, we, we went by the, the Simmons et al. article where, you know, with just wiggling some covariates and optional stopping, they got up to 60, right? Uh, 3 percent, I believe it was, false positive rate. Uh, so the K there would be from 0.05 to 63, right? That would be the false. 0.6. And so to, to break this down for simplicity, uh, Let's consider a population of studies that are broken up into half unsound studies and half sound studies. Right. And unsound studies are going to be extremely unsound. They're just not going to even respond to the significant threshold. Whatever you set it at, they're like, I can attain significance. Right. Something like fraud. Give me your alpha, I'll give you significance. Right. And sound studies respond in the normal way. Right. These are perfectly sound studies. If you lower alpha, their false discovery rate. The y axis decreases. They do the, the perfectly expected thing. Well, what happens when you lower the significant threshold of a community made up of both sound and unsound studies? As we saw, the unsound studies are not affected, and the rate of publication are significant, and then publication, the sound studies do the thing we want them to do. And what that means is you produce the countervailing effect to how these are making an improvement with how little impact they have on significant uh, studies and therefore on publication. So sound studies get significance less, get published less, 
under a regime of publication bias. And Anton study in the opaque line make a larger and larger relative contribution, making it so that if you looked at your field for a moment, you'd get a decrease, uh, or initially you'd get a decrease in the pulse discovery rate, followed by at some point inevitably an increase in the pulse discovery rate as your literature becomes dominated by unsound sites that continue to be able to make your new higher evidentiary threshold. So this result is that if some fraction of studies is maximally unsound, right, and that's an important assumption, that you can get graded versions of this with relative unsoundness. Uh, it's a perfectly flexible and meaningful significant threshold, and lowering the significant threshold will ultimately increase the false discovery rate of a literature, a population of studies, even with discipline. Good. Uh, but there are other, I think, uh, even more plausible ways that this pattern comes out. And I think if you start thinking about it, I, I want to kind of sensitize you to just to this pattern <coughs> one of many, um, in which the difference in how an intervention affects subparts of a literature, of a, of a population of studies, produces this kind of reversal, right? So the pattern was. If it filters more dramatically studies with better statistical properties and studies with worse properties, right? as you do it, their relative contribution to literature filtered by significant results getting published more makes the worst studies more common in your body of, of publications. So here we're going to construct that way, uh, observing again, lowering significant threshold, observing that uh, a specific or questionable research practice. Here, I, what I'm going to call fallback harking, which is a very, I'm going to pause it a plausible version of what researchers do when they hark hypothesizing after results are known. Um, under a researcher, under a regime in which researchers' judgment is well informed, and we'll see what that means. That means that they know anything about their domain. Again, publication bias. And again, uh, we're going to observe uh, here studies employing more questionable research practices. And attain significant more effectively than those that do not. Uh, here, let's contrast what harking looks like in prediction. So, this is a, the normative protocol for a scientific study is the researcher uses her judgment to pick out a promising hypothesis for test. Right? And that, that articulates that first assumption that they're informed. If they're informed, the thing that they picked out to test, the hypothesis that they're testing, is informed by their background knowledge. The of, the, of the domain by theory, by previous results. So in that lucky world where that is, has any informational value at all, they're going to do better than chance. They're going to do better than randomly constructing a hypothesis. Right? So the fraction of hypotheses, uh, of true hypotheses from the ones that they choose should be better than a random choice of any logically possible hypothesis. Filtration by test. Are going to be as normal, significant published, uh, significant find published just as before. So we're just articulating really what we had before, but with an emphasis that the, the observation that the researcher is informed. Because by the way, if they're counter informed, parking is better. You should randomly pick hypotheses. When you, and there are places where we know that we actually work with chance in some domains. So so some tetlock work for that. Uh, so, parking, what do we do? This is kind of counter normative. You start with the possible hypotheses, you don't filter them. You're just like, look, anything that could work with my data, right? Maybe the things that you measured were like height and age and some socioeconomic variables. Any possible hypothesis compatible with those, I'm, I'm not going to pre-commit. Anything that comes out, I plan to publish. The right. parking is you just give it to the test, and whatever is significant, you, that's what gets published. You see the difference here, you commit. And if you get something significant that was not what you committed to, you don't uh, submit that. Here you do. Right. Now, fallback parking just consists in starting with the, the kind of ideal picture. You're, you're kind of a, a, a scientist who has the image of who knows what they should be doing. Commit to hypothesis. And if your hypothesis is significant, just like here, you submit it for publication. But if you get nothing, that's not an acceptable result for you, right? 
and have done all this work and have nothing to submit for publication. You go and you dredge your data and you say, did anything else become significant, right? And if something did, you choose one of those and you submit that for publication. That's fallback carpet. For those of you studies, this is a very possible and realistic model of how, <laughs> of how this is done, right? When we're not doing rigorous career registration. Good. So what does this do? Well, what happens is that we lower the significance threshold. The studies that are sound that are doing prediction full stop, no fallback arcing, do exactly what we expect they would do. Pure false discoveries. Those that engage in fallback arcing, right? Well, what happens is the harder and harder that you make it for them to attain significance on their first hypothesis, which is the one they were informed of, the one they thought was plausible, the one that was informed by theory, by their domain knowledge, by whatever, right? The one that was better than a randomly chosen hypothesis that was just possible. Well, they're less likely to get a significance on that one. But if, if they can dig into their data and look at every other possible hypothesis, one of those is quite likely to think to use it. So when you push them off their good hypotheses, you push them onto their bad hypotheses, which are likely to get, one of which is likely to get significant. And again, you blow up the false discovery rate of your literature. So under this kind of a behavior, right, if researchers choice of hypothesis are, are informed, and they're employing something that looks like fallback arcing, then lowering the significance threshold can increase the false discovery rate of the literature. So this is the kind of first sketch that I want to give you of mine for how this kind of entanglement can happen. Let's think of something, which again, I said, I'm a big fan of pre-registration. Let's think of a version of it that is voluntary. Just as a reminder, this is right. The specification of your study design, design and plan before you conduct it. Good. Now, voluntary pre registration in particular right now is promoted, I think, again, for sensible reasons, right? which is the idea, the idea is if you force folk to do it, uh, that can create backlash, like that can make it harder to get people on board. Uh, it can make it quite difficult for certain study designs, certain kind of uh, extenuating circumstances to accommodate that, right? Even though I want to mention the Open Science Framework does have options that accommodate most of the kind of contingencies one could think of. But we often advocate for this being uh, voluntary for those eminently right, uh, reasonable considerations. And the hope is when you get enough people to do it, at some point, it'll just become, right, we'll, we'll hit that critical mass, it'll become a norm, and then we're, we've gotten there. So there are good reasons for pursuing a voluntary uh, regime. And we're going to look at, again, voluntary pre-registration, publication bias in the background, QRPs produce differences in study soundness. Uh, and now let's notice that voluntary pre-registration and study soundness can be positively correlated. Same pattern. So what makes you likely pre-register is going to be like correlated with the kind of positive statistical properties of studies. So pre-registration will filter good studies more than it will filter bad studies. Uh, how we model pre-registration is uh, when a study is pre-registered, right, it goes from its default level of unsoundness, which is KA, K alpha, down to some intermediate unsoundness between that and being perfectly sound. So we don't need if registration to do magic, it just needs to make you better. Well, as we've seen right in studies, it doesn't typically get people all the way. Right? But as we've seen also, it does make marginal improvements to the soundness of studies that are pre-registered in ways that are actually quite noticeable, if imperfect. So voluntary pre-registration can make it, and I'm going to assume this, this is like the correlating mechanism, right? I'm going to uh, put, it, put it to you to see how plausible it is. That researchers, on average, who are more likely to pre register their studies are also more likely to already employ more sound methods. So, you take the fraction of researchers in your field and say, Which of you are for the voluntary pre registration? And I look at them and I'm like, On average, how much are they already using better methods? Right. And if that's correlated, you get the effect again. The ones who are already more likely to, create some, to engage in more sound studies and 
employ Morristown method are now willing to do this extra thing because they're already on board with that project, right? So this can create again the sound dependent filtration study. Uh, and this is going to go the way you imagine. Uh, and, I, and I don't need to belabor this. Once you've gotten that concept, right, you're filtering the people who are already using better methods, therefore producing on average better results more strenuously than those that aren't. And this can create a reversal and you can leave you as more folk pre-register or as more strongly correlated with, with uh, how good they already were. This can decrease the soundness, the net soundness of your study in a field. And this is not the only correlating mechanism that can produce this. So if that's the result, now imagine the further two assumptions. The correlating device can be not just uh, the tendency of the researchers toward sound methods, it can also be the confidence of the researcher. So if researchers who are already more confident in their studies are more likely to re-register them because they know that because they're tying their hands behind their back, they're more willing to do that on something they're like, I think it's true. I'm confident this will attain significance. I'll be able to publish this. Right. If that correlates at all, again, you get sound dependent filtration. And the hypothesis that were more likely to be true, you know, the judgment of the uh, researcher will again be more likely to be registered, be, be filtered more intensely, and that can arrange the outcome uh, of the literature. And this is just checking the kind of running over the data suggesting indeed researchers are not utterly uncorrelated in their judgment. And the likelihood of hypotheses being true, here we see some studies, at least with their colleagues' studies, they're actually remarkably good in guessing which will replicate. We get the same effect and that was our final results. One thing I want to highlight about these vignettes in this framework, right, is that this, this dynamic of soundness dependent filtration has always been at play. That's to say that, that bad methods pay, and they pay, they pay in the cash value of significant results. And it's always been true. And folks who were committed more to sound methods you know, from, from, from meals time and before were taking on a cost to themselves as being less likely, right, all else being equal, to publish. And we're always producing a literature that's distorted in its outcomes right, by those who are using poor methods. Paying significance. Good. And this, this certainly has implications for evolutionary models of science, a la you know, Moldino, Grimes, and others who think of the kind of natural selection of, of bad science. Right. This is absolutely feeding into that process. Uh, and then, in this their condition for, for the whole that you observe, is sound misdependent. I'm sorry, is publication bias. Right. If we get rid of this and we just have a literature. Let's say, I think one of the best ways to do this is something like registered reports. And we defang these sorts of problems. Because if, you, if any of you have ever reviewed a study of the registered report, you notice that you have to assess it by how good is the question and how well designed is this study to pursue that question, to test that question. Like that's exactly what I should be right, treating it for, not on how. Uh, that he was the result, result, not on whether it's significant or not, right? Is that, is that a good question? Is this well, test well designed for that question? Uh, and if all the studies are there and you're not incentivized, you remove all the incentives for methodological bias if folks know that those are the things that get them published and not significant. Yeah, and I mentioned for, for discussion, there are kind of subtle effects of these same interventions, this kind of same discussion on sign and magnitude errors. We discussed earlier. Uh, right, and what can this do? This is just some simple illustration that already they can suggest to us that this line of thinking, while it will not answer all our questions, if you're done like modeling like this, and if you think that you know interventions are right, but that, that's not right, right. We know that this always needs to be balanced with empirical work, with experimenting, seeing how well did it actually work, how well, how does this match studies on profitability under different intervention regimes. But this does give us a sketch of what we would expect. Right? And here, for example, with significant thresholds, it'll tell you that when you put those factors together, there will be an awful point. So if you start getting an increased uh, failure to replicate as you're lowering your output at some point, 
will tell you there's some point which, if you measure that, will be your optimal point if your aim is to minimize right, failed replication. So can, being equipped with the framework can tell that and then quite a bit more when you start using it to assess these things. Right? It won't be our final word, but it is indeed elucidating for thinking through how we assess these proposals to change norms. Uh, I think one of the other things is suggested assessing replication uh, report replication rates by the type of study. Uh, that is a more explicitly codifying that there is a difference between a registered, right, a registered report, and again, a just a, a pre-registered study, and again, one that has done neither. That last one, especially now, should ring some alarm bells for us more and more, unless there's really some kind of legitimate extenuating circumstances. Um, or at least in the very least, or if you have those, you should recognize there's a different kind of thing with different statistical properties of that test, right? An expectation. Uh, and to adjust our expectations from improvement, right, for these interventions, because we notice that there are going to be quite plausibly the mitigating features that I think very often, you know, I gave the, the exaggerated conditions of producing full reversal. Very often, they're not going to produce full reversal. They're just going to mediate how effective these interventions are. And right, uh, the thing that we want to remember is that interventions in our evidentiary standards and research practices uh, will not affect all research, all studies equally. And that that means something for that we should pay attention to. Whenever they're not uncorrelated, right, these kinds of effects are possible. Uh, publication bias is, is something that we should have really been done with by now. And uh, uh, there, there's something about sharing a model like this in the background for organizing some of our thinking about these proposals and talking together and recognizing this as a decision process, right? That's up to us to make better in navigating our way to future sciences. Uh, and with a kind of a call back to that reminder that I, the false discovery is not the only measure. We care about a lot of things about science, right? And having a, a competent conversation involves recognizing these things. I think some of the essential research questions that I've, I've been looking at right now and that should be more part of our conversation, hopefully, as we figure out more, are what are trade offs between those measures that we want, right? So, their interaction effects, uh, non linearities, other wrinkles that we need to be alert to at, at the population level of interventions. Thank you all. Thank you very much. We have about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, good on time, I guess. Uh, so I have one, two. So let's begin there first. Yeah, I have a clarification question about your study. So at first, I thought that your plots were based on conceptual argu arguments and they were near representations, but then I noticed that there were differences in scales. Are they based on simulations? Your these are analytic results. Just, just analytic results. But, but then why are, are the differences in scale only then for clarity of presentation? Is this what you're thinking of? Yeah, you know. Why are yeah. they going to 0.5 rather than one? Yeah, for example, um, yeah, I noticed some clear differences in in, uh, in the max of the y-axis, for example. The y-axis. Yeah. Uh, this was just for the chosen value for the plots, right? Because you know okay. they're the kind of the proposition is, is general. Mm -hmm. the, the illustrated one needs to kind of plug in numbers. Okay, so it's for purely for illustration purposes. Yeah. Then. Uh, yeah. Thanks for for the talk. Um, so I think I, I like the, the the general idea of having this general framework to to kind of try to make more precise uh, certain interventions and evaluating them. Uh, but then I was wondering, uh, um, out of curiosity, uh, about how comprehensive this can be to to capture many of the things that people discuss in, in when they discuss uh, interventions, right? So I'm thinking in particular about uh, like social interventions that I, I think are very important, and actually I'm probably more, at this point more of a fan of those interventions than statistical interventions and methodological interventions. Like, for instance, rethinking how we allocate funding, rethinking how we uh, um, design promotion guidelines, that, that sort of thing. So do you think this is something that we should treat separately or is, is there a way of capturing that in this uh, 
uh, uh, framework or uh, yeah yeah i think it's absolutely right that this framework does not and this this, this uh system absolutely does not capture all of what we would care about about science and all of what we would consider about changing and improving about science absolutely uh, indeed i mean the there's a fraction of science for which this represents a reasonable pipeline right uh portion of science which does not consist in filtration via null hypothesis significance test right? um and so uh, the uh very right i think each of those is going to we think of what is the appropriate way of engaging with social incentives right uh engaging with uh the criteria or for, for, for promotion and accreditation within institutions uh, at most practice this could uh, inform perhaps some of those conversations so if you can think of uh the sorts of incentives we produce we might think of the effect of one of the things that surely we care about in science is the, the distribution of the literature produced by science is it more reliable and so on and insofar as we could attempt to represent those interventions impact right uh they might be able to be brought side to side but uh that's, that's absolutely right this is not all we care about yeah thank you for this interesting talk um i think it does add a new a new reason for caring about publication bias um, but since publication bias doesn't seem to actually affect the false discovery rate, since that's just about significant findings, I'm not sure if we don't need to think more about uh, how people read science and what really the next step is. It's just getting more, and basically we have lots of null results on preprint service, still not enough, but they are there. They're not published in high impact journals. But I'm not sure if that would make a huge difference in the way science is currently consumed in the sense that obviously all the significant findings are reported, but also I think most scientists still don't do comprehensive literature searches when focusing their introductions and so on. Um, so yeah, I mean, in, in the model, I don't think it's kind of a, a very sort of complicated next step, but I was wondering if you have any thoughts on interventions that actually change the reception of science rather than just the body of things out there yeah yeah good question and let me say this back to you uh, to make sure that i'm understanding it correctly what you're thinking is look uh let's say there was no publication bias in these models so we have a literature that has significant findings and the non-significant findings and they just have some fraction of significant ones that are false and true and a fraction of the non-significant ones that are false and true um the fact that we have all of them available but say the propositions we care about doesn't change it it's still just true that the fraction that are right significant uh and false is whatever it is based on the tests and the base rates and the and so and the, the pipeline um and so i'm not changing that quantity by presenting the things that turned out to be not significant yeah yeah and so uh i think that would not help the mode of consumption which is the the uh the beware the man with, with uh one, one study kind of admonition right the person who cherry picks uh a study and says i can you know uh or only looks at one study in their research process and takes its conclusion uh, at face value uh, but it will undermine things that we do care about like meta-analyses it will undermine uh, certainly within science uh one of our main modes of, of figuring out the reliability of propositions which is looking at all the things adjacent to it and saying uh there's a beautiful uh contribution from 1918 by a small town doctor in uh the, uh, the new england journal of medicine in which the uh the fellow wrote you know i heard that this you know treatment for i forget what it was babies or something like that um is really effective uh in this journal uh and then you know i applied it to my patient and it didn't work and i realized that that the, that had this been tried twice and one time it was effective, um, or had this been tried a thousand times and one time it was effective, I don't I have no idea, right? About all the other times that this was tested, and so I want to register my one time. This was not effective, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I think it's right for certain kinds of cons consumption. 
having more studies, including null results, uh, won't help. But I think it, uh, I think that that kind of consumption has a different kind of treatment I, that I, I would think of and advocate in the long run, which is I think we should, what, as, a, as a researcher, you should not let the one study when you're investigating a proposition. Uh, as researchers, we should not promote our one study to the level of, of popular science. Uh, as a kind of cultural norm, we should say that that's just, unless this study was, you know, at a very different level of reliability, right? Uh, that the norm should be an analysis encoding their level of uncertainty that aggregate the full body of what we know so far. Um, and under that regime, publication bias is a big deal. Uh, we have several questions. We will begin with Anna and then James and then Daniel. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. I really love the, the clarity of this, uh, of this concept. And, uh, and um, we think we're thinking along very similar lines, but also um, I'm doing some work on registered reports that's very similar to this. And uh, I have something yeah, a little bit between the comments and the question. So one of the things I've been thinking about is that uh, you assume that uh, soundness is, I think, but I think you implicitly assume that soundness that is not a factor that's evaluated. And uh, so, and I think that's not true. So I think there's some notion that to some extent, uh, other researchers can detect the actual level of soundness of a study and that that factors into probability of getting published or having impact and so on, right? And so I think that is sort of a trade-off that uh, people applying QRPs are facing. And there's like only so much you can get away with. You might want to maximize what you can get away with, right? To still seem to be adhering to a certain level of soundness. And so, uh, yeah, it's not like, but you think about that, like how does it, how would that change uh, um, your conclusions and uh, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, let me see that I, I heard you correctly. You're doing that look uh, kind of like with the camera study, your uh, future they're not oblivious to the reliability of Right, they're, they're calling findings. And one part of that surely is not just that they've got really good priors on what hypothesis is likely true, they know how sound their methods are to some degree. There's some information content about the sound of the methods here that doesn't enable to set a prediction. So that constrains what other researchers can get away with in terms of QR. Is that right? Uh, yes, and particularly to what, like, in terms of getting published and getting published at certain. Journals, right? So it's not like you can hack everything. Sure. There's a limit. That's right. That's right. Uh, and I think it's absolutely right. There, there's there, there, that, that said, it is actually extraordinary that I'm thinking of this, uh, uh, right? These, these famous cases uh, uh, fraud in which uh, researchers the copy pasted portions of other papers. So sometimes we're not nearly as uh, good at filtering. Uh, at, at the level of uh, peer review, but but that you know, what you say is absolutely true. That we're also not utterly blind, and there's only so much that someone can get away with, right? Um, and I think that's absolutely right. And the main effect that has is it mediates how bad the worst case scenarios for QRPs are. are. And indeed, you'll notice, and there's lots of research supporting that. You're exactly right. That, that the behavior that we engage in is compatible with. We know how much we can get away with. Right, but people don't take, don't round up uh, p values uh, 0.8.05, right? Which, when we look at the characteristic distribution of applications, we can tell that everyone's nudging their results over the line. Uh, and and there is, while there is fraud, it's much less. Um, so I think that that mediates, in particular, the extreme cases of the backfire effect. When you, if you want to give an empirical, so it doesn't qualitatively change anything, but these are just analytically true propositions. They're, Thing when there's such a relationship, there's such an outcome. But I think the cases I often demonstrated full reversals that require something like so. For the first example, it required there being some studies that can be maximally unsound, right? Um, and if you say no, no, they can't be maximally unsound. This is the kind of distribution of QRPs and their impact on that K quantity. How bad could it get? I think uh, you get a lowering of that. Uh, how dramatic that curve is. Um, right, so this would not, it might go further before it goes up, right? And it might not go all the way up to one. It might, so I think it's going to mediate the effects, but the fact that they're going to be worse than what would, one would predict without understanding this dynamic is going to hold. Yeah. Uh, 
a great question. Thank you. James? Yeah, I really enjoyed um, your talk. Uh, I'm curious, I mean, you deployed this um, idea of the Bayesian reasoner, you know, uh, and this is kind of like a way of thinking about this collective Bayesian reasoner with respect to particular claims. Um, but, you know, when I think about like Bayesian optimization, which is all about like balancing explore and exploit, I'm wondering the degree to which or what insights your filter model um, proposed for like stay versus shift across the distribution of claims. Because it seems to me that they're not silent on, uh, you know, I mean, once you're sufficiently certain in some areas, where do you invest your marginal additional uh, certainty? And uh, and their their analytical guidances that are underlying these things, but not represented here. So how how do you, um, you know, yeah, how, how do you think about that? And I would say, you know, like a comparable vertical is, uh, you know, as you discover in one disjoint part of the data distribution, you confirm in another part of that distribution, right? So so I think even in that sense, like the distribution of articulable hypotheses, which I would say sums up the space from which like a hark draws, hypothesizing after that, is still itself not completely unconstrained. <coughs> and, um, suggests something about this kind of district, you know, so yeah, so just. Yeah, yeah. fantastic question. Uh, I would highlight that they, right, I didn't explicitly involve the Bayesian reasoner here, but it's absolutely something I've been thinking about I've, and I've gestured at it as important for the, the measure that we care about, right? Because uh, if you said correctly, the Bayesian reasoner is not needed for any of this. We're not taking her perspective here, uh, but it is the moment that we want to think of more measures and in particular informativeness that guides action, yeah. just as you said. Um, but I have been thinking a lot about that and I'm, 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 I'm good. Absolutely, get something important here, and and uh, to your question, right? And why is it important? Because I think the more competent version of us will be sitting from that perch, right? It has the Bayesian reasoner who's aggregating our literature and saying, "What is the optimal policy action here, given my uncertainty? What is the optimal medical treatment here to kind of save the most lives, given what this literature is telling me as of right now?" Uh, and we want her to take her perspective as much as possible in those kinds of judgments. Uh, with respect to her behavior in a kind of explore exploit type dynamic, uh, I have not put it through, kind of set up what is that uh, decision problem for her here. But there are some things I can say just kind of analytically that'll fall out of uh, this framework. Uh, and I, and I mentioned that, that yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing that is true of her is that she performs better in expectation, right? With more information. Right? The, the more information we give her, the better on average her performance in things like bandit problems and explore exploit trade offs. Uh, so, what we do know is that for her, publication bias matters a great deal because the more information you give her, the better she does. And for her, she's not going to care about the significance testing. She's going to say, give me your data. I don't care about your analysis. I'm going to make right, the optimal inference given those. Uh, and with her, the set of interventions that we pick are the ones that produce maximal information available to her at the end of this, this process. Uh, but for, for, yeah, I think that that's the one thing that comes to me clearly that, that, would, that would stand out to her from her vantage. Uh, though I mentioned that for a kind of different framing of the explore exploit uh, exploit trade off, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, work in, in uh, our, our corner of things in uh, formal epistemology uh, by that started as kind of introduced uh, from a bandit model of uh, Bala Goyal in economics by Kevin Zolman. And then uh, there's been kind of a, a literature of, of folks thinking about the kind of problem, the premature lock in in those type of situations. Uh, Office folk here have contributed to that literature. Uh, and that, that picks it up, at least from myopic agent agents. And those folks have figured out uh, and demonstrated conditions under which that myopic agent agent, so not, not, not a super competent one, one that's kind of doing a one step ahead. What, what do you investigate? Uh, and for her, they've asked what kind of network structure. I'm not sure, uh, you might already be familiar with, with these studies, but they've asked what kind of network structure. 
are conducive to more reliably getting at the optimal action and which get her to kind of prematurely lock in mostly by getting something like too strong of an evidential uh, influx at a given time, which gets her to just think, this is the best action. I'm never going to experiment with other stuff again. Uh, but that's just gesturing at, at, at your question for, for uh, something adjacent to it in the literature. Uh, thank you, great, great question. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Now, I, I wasn't a big fan of the lowering the alpha recommendation. It's also interesting, by the way, that somebody did a follow-up study and many of the original authors didn't even follow their own advice. It's kind of <laughs> funny, but, uh, uh, but in their paper, to their credit, they do say, well, we shouldn't stop publishing uh, these findings that are uh, above 0 0.005. We should still publish everything. And of course, that's uh, easy to, to say. Right, I can I can say that yeah, of course we should have world peace and uh, everything will be fine. <laughs> uh, but it's kind of implausible that would happen. I would guess, right? You highlight some other cases which are actually quite plausible. I think to happen, but you can highlight a bunch more things, right? So in all these evaluations, in advance of what the consequences of these models are, I, I have the feeling that different sides will just highlight the things they hope will happen. Fingers crossed, people will just keep publishing things, even though, you know, uh, they will probably only publish things below 0 0.005, I think, you know, that seems plausible to me, but anyway, we can debate this. But how much of all these effects, because there are many more, I think what Anna mentioned is a good one, like you could build a model and say, people will not replicate studies, like not build on studies that are not pre-registered. I mean, it could be. If that happens, that would change things quite considerably. For example, all sorts of things can happen, and it's so difficult to predict. So how much can we get from the, let's say, a priori evaluation to really make a decision whether we should do this or not, and how much should we just do it and then be wrong every now and then? But because how can we, how can we really predict? There's so much stuff that could possibly happen and so difficult to model, right? Yeah, yeah. Just so, I think that we should not engage in this sort of modeling and then uh, bet the family fortune on knowing <laughs> uh, precisely how these interventions will play out. Uh, this, this can inform our expectations, but I think uh, more importantly, in tandem with running the experiment, doing more replication studies, doing right locally, trying out those interventions and seeing what's happening, just as we have to some degree with changing the alpha in some places. Uh, employing a time mandatory and optional, right, uh, for registration and others, then we come back and we want to analyze what does that mean, right? And what do we expect to be the set of factors that might be, help us understand what is going on, right? Uh, that's the context in which I think this is going to be helpful. Yeah, so, so that the goal is more to warn people in advance of things to keep in mind as we might uh, roll out interventions or not, things that are likely to have big effects, the mess it up, basically. That's right, because so, uh, uh, probably like a number of you, I, I, uh, I bet money on replication markets. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, right, I do use a framework just like this, but I think about uh, how, what's the likelihood of this study. Right? So, and I've come to learn over time how much weight do I put on uh, the domain and its base rate in, my, in my reasonable assessments a lot. Right? Uh, you realize that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a priming study. <laughs> I should start with 70% chance it's not going to replicate, right? That's a kind of microeconomic, right, uh, type study, and you're like, okay, that's actually a 70% chance that it is going to replicate. You can think of like interesting puzzles of why, right? That's the way I start. And then you look at study power and key value and so on, and you begin to update. You can get their relative sense of their contribution. And so this framework means to temper thinking about some of those things. Uh, but you uh, shan't leave this by having felt confident about large scale interventions that are surely going to have other. Here's a bet I would be willing to take. There are other factors than the ones that I mentioned, right, that will have some kind of observable impact on the efficacy of intervention. That is a bet I would take. I would not take the bet that it's going to come out exactly the way we choose. In the interest of time, but we, maybe we can have like one last question and keep it short so that people can uh, enjoy their coffee reasonably slowly. Uh, so, Mike, yeah. 
Um, so I'll, I'll make this the, the short version of my question, um, which is, what would you say to someone who said, we can solve all of this by fixing peer review? Um, so it's relatively easy, like in replication markets, to guess which ones are going to replicate and which ones aren't. Um, assuming there's some truth to the matter of like what practices these people are using, it's not just fraud. Um, then there's a pretty good chance that looking at peer review, that a good peer reviewer with the proper time and resources will be able to sort all this stuff out and figure out whether this is a good study or not. So we don't have to worry about the details, just fix peer review. Yeah. So I would say that when I think of that, uh, that one's clear to me. So that, to that, to my imaginary interlocutor, I would say that that's provably not true. Um, and the reason is, again, taking the meta-analyst perspective, I can, insofar as peer review with re, remains in the framework where, where there's publication bias, right? and folks are not getting all of the information that they could get in making an informed assessment for purposes like saving lives, implementing policy. Right? I can write out the proof with you very quickly as to why I would expect them to do worse than the same agent who has all those Right, uh, results that didn't even that didn't make it through peer review to publication. Uh, and then I would actually, uh, on the betting end, I would expect that to actually make quite a big difference. Um, I, one of the things in the space of intervention that I think we need to grapple with is we want to be as informed as possible for the state in which we make decisions, uh, and that means a different pipeline and one that is, that is not lofty the way this one is lofty. Uh, and now I, I think that there are valuable things about peer review that, that there are ways that one could make it better. I'm actually kind of, I'm conflicted about some of the peer review stuff. I'm not sure. I definitely don't feel confident at this point that I know the optimal form of peer review and the kind of proposals around pre and post public. I don't, I don't feel sold on knowing the solution as much there, but I do know that there are other problems that if they're not addressed, it will just not be enough. One more from okay. Okay. Yeah. Then it is uh, the last coffee break, and we're all gonna meet again here for the plenary. Ten minutes. In ten minutes. In ten minutes. Yeah.